sense? That's a good segue. Honestly, better than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah, talking about like uh, pent up, expressing pent up feelings that you've had for a long time, but we're too stubborn to admit. Um, <laughs> hi, Elle Hanley. <laughs> welcome. Um, okay, Dennis, that's fair. Uh, so, welcome to Sketching Shakespeare. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm... less good after. Uh... <laughs> I'm Steph, uh, the Shakespeare part. I'm Swan, the sketching part. And this is Mike, the talent. Hey, y'all. I'm new here <laughs> and only for today. So um, we are going to sketch from Shakespeare, Shakespeare today. Uh, we're going to do it all. <laughs> like Sean Connery. Um, oh, boy. oh, no. <laughs> we are, uh, Mike and I are going to read my favorite scene from all of Shakespeare. Um, we're going to read through that. We're going to talk through some context. We're going to talk through the content. We're going to go through. Uh, it's a it's a divisive scene for us. Um, we both have very different interpretations of it. And to add on to that, Swan is going to draw a comic panel from the text. Uh, so we've got a little bit more of a, a longer chunk of scene today than we had um, the past couple times. So we've got a lot more happening. Um, and it is, uh, it's great that you're all here. Thank you all for, for joining. Um, Mike, do you want to tell people where they can where they can find your stuff? Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, I normally play on a fifth edition uh, Dungeons and Dragons podcast called Adventure Incorporated. Uh, we release an episode every Monday morning uh, and have done so for the past five years. Uh, we are coming up on the end of our first campaign. Uh, it is litty. Uh, it is crazy. Um, I also uh, have a podcast called Ask the Pokedexpert, where I am a uh, a real life Pokemon biologist, sociologist, and social biologist. Uh, and I take questions from the audience who have very real Pokemon questions about the Pokemon that they own. Uh, we've had incredible guest stars uh, on the show. Uh, we had a we had a uh, a Swan named Emily come on as Professor Mauve, who uh, was the responsible party for Mauve's anatomy. Uh, we have had Steph on as the co-owner of the Celios Business Podcast Network uh, that had until recently employed the Pokedex for it. Um, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, and you can also find me every Wednesday night on a show called Almost Daily Discourse. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, had a brain fart for a minute there. Uh, the ADHD kicked in hard. I started thinking about something else. Uh, almost Daily Discourse on twitch.tv slash almost daily pod. Now, if you're here for the art part of this uh, segment, Emily, tell us where you're doing art. Yeah, I'm doing art across the internet at a swan named Emily. That's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the things. You can follow me on this channel for more art. Uh, coming up next Friday will be my next regular art stream. And then next Saturday, the 27th, will be the next Doodle Crew. So me and a bunch of friends get together. We create some art. Since it's a Saturday, it's going to be a Saturday morning cartoons, which is a fan favorite. Yeah, so that one's going to be fun. We finally picked exactly what our theme for Saturday morning cartoons are going to be this week. So I'm excited about that. Uh, yeah, that's the big thing. And then we've got a little bit of time off, but coming up on the 5th, of april that's how time works uh will be the next in addition with me and steph yeah, yeah. um so you can find us uh at twitch.tv slash almost daily pod every first and third monday night swan and i uh do the same thing that the add boys do but better a hundred percent better <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh yes the next one is coming up on april 5th but you can check out our shows um if you look up almost daily discourse on your podcatchers of choice. As for me, I run a Shakespeare podcast called Protest Too Much, P2M Pod, and we have our next live show tomorrow night at twitch.tv slash srsbiz underscore network. And that is going to be a live showdown. Uh, and you're going to see some really silly Shakespeare. So it's going to be a heck of a time. 
Um, that's where you can find all of our stuff. And I'm ready to jump yeah. into Much Ado About Nothing. Um, <laughs> much Ado About A Lot of Things. <laughs> so I gave Swan a little bit of context for this scene. And if you are new to sketching Shakespeare, basically Swan takes the very little context that I give her um, and then kind of listens through the text and just draws her interpretation of what this scene might look like in a, in a couple panels. And so we get to talk about art. We get to talk about Shakespeare. Uh, we're both just nerding out for a, for a Sunday afternoon. Um, and I brought this scene to the table today. Um, first of all, because it was on my mind, um, Mike and I just, the most recent episode of my podcast is a WandaVision episode. So basically we took our favorite Shakespeare characters and decided what classic sitcoms they would live through in their like grief bubble. So we decided on Beatrice and Benedict because they're our favorites. And going through that made me really like nostalgic for this play, which is a weird thing because it's not something in my past. It's something that just always exists. Um, so when I was looking at scenes to bring today for sketching Shakespeare, I decided that it would be really cool to get to see Swan's interpretation of it. Um, so for y'all, um, to give you the tiniest bit of context, this is at a wedding. <laughs> um, it's at a wedding. Beatrice's cousin, Hero, was just left at the altar, um, accused of adultery, and Beatrice is sad about it. Uh, her fia hero's fiance, not husband, Claudio, just left her for dead at the altar. Like it was a big blow up. Um, everything was bad, and this is where Beatrice is at this point. And before we hop in, uh, do you want me to read this through your interpretation? Uh, and then we can talk about my thought about it after. Um, I want you to read it however you, if you want to go through your interpret, like if you want to just take it as it is and we can see how it goes. Sure. <laughs> just see what happens. Mike and I have very different feelings about this scene. So <laughs> we're going to see what happens. Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Yay, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. You have no reason. I do it freely. Surely I do believe your fair cousin is wrong. <laughs> How much might the man deserve of me that would write her? Is there any way to show such friendship? A very even way, but no such friend. May a man do it? It is a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? <laughs> as strange as a thing I know not. <laughs> it were as possible for me to say that I love nothing so well as you, but believe me not, and yet I lie not. I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I am sorry for my cousin. By my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me, and I will make him eat it that says I love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no sauce that can be devised to it, I protest I love thee. Why then? God forgive me. What offense, sweet Beatrice? You've stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest. I love you. And do it with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart that none is left to protest. Come, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. <sighs> Not for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Terry, sweet Beatrice. I am gone, though I am here. There is no love in you. Nay, I pray you, let me go. Beatrice. No, I, in faith, I will go. We'll be friends first. You dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy? Is Claudio thine enemy? Is he not approved in the height of villain that hath slandered, scorned, and dishonored my kinswoman? What? Bear her in hand until they come to take hands, and then with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor. God, that I were a man, I would eat his heart in the marketplace. 
hear me. Talk with a man out at a window. A proper saying, a sweet of, hero, she is wronged, she is slandered, she is undone. Princes and counties. Surely, a princely testimony, a goodly count, count comfit, a sweet gallant, surely. Oh, that I were a man for his sake. Or that I had any friend who would be a man for my sake. But manhood is melted into curtsies, valor into compliment, and men are only turned into tongue and trim ones too. He is now as valiant as Hercules that only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing, therefore I will die a woman with grieving. Terry, good Beatrice, by this hand I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you in your soul that Count Claudio hath wronged Hero. Yeah, as sure as I have a thought or a soul. Enough. I am engaged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand and so I leave you. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. Go. Comfort your cousin. I must say she is dead, and so farewell. Beep, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop. That is a big one. Like. Yeah, it is a, it is a, like I said, it's a roller coaster. Um, a lot happens in it. And I, I'm going to hold, um, I'm going to hold my thoughts. I want to, I want to let Mike talk about it a little bit. Um, I want to talk first for a second. I haven't seen Wayne's world too. I need someone <laughs> else to, to corroborate Dennis's thought that it's Kim Basinger's character's proposition in Garth and Wayne's world too. I need to like, I feel like I need to see this scene. Like I need it linked or I need it something because if it is um, a quote unquote fancier version of it, or if it's like a, some heightened version of that, that's amazing. And would 10 out of 10 get me to watch Wayne's world too. <laughs> I haven't seen Wayne's World 1, so. That one is good. So when you first said that, like, I know it says Wayne's World 2, but I was thinking of Wayne's World 1 with the, the psycho host beast, and she's like, you you got me a gun rack. And it's <laughs> insane. And it it's, I don't know, it's old school, ridiculous fun, and Mike Myers and Dana Carvey, and yeah, the first one's a lot of fun. So there's no, uh, I'm going to be frank, okay, can I still be Garth uh, in this? But uh, I do... I do see a little bit of where he's coming from. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so talk me through when you think about that scene. Um, oh, oh, oh. Okay. So it's like literally yeah. like this scene. There's a, a death proposition. I was reading a different. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then he runs if that feels like the comedy aspect of it. Yeah. Okay. That's really fun. Dennis, I love that. Shakespeare is forever. Um, <laughs> So yeah, Mike, talk me through your thoughts here. Uh, so basically, when we did this show, uh, I had the hardest time trying to figure out this scene from Benedict's perspective. Because he starts this scene, no, I am not killing my best friend. I refuse. That's ridiculous. And then not even a hundred lines later, He's like, yeah, all right. You know what? Screw it. I'll kill him. Let's do this. I'm engaged. Here we go. Like, and there's nothing in Beatrice's speech that's like a convincing argument so much as an impassioned plea, right? And if I'm that hard no at the beginning, I need convincing and it doesn't happen here. And so I had to like kind of stretch it, right? To think... Okay, first off, this is a comedy. So where is the funny in this scene? Uh, it doesn't exist as written, right? And so if it doesn't exist as written, that means it has to be physical or it has to be something that the actors are doing with each other that isn't in the text. And benedict has to agree to kill his best friend uh at the end of it and so like how does he do that and my like my hunting for it came about like uh i decided that benedict is like jealous of claudio and like uh the way that he's getting closer with some of the other characters in the play and so this is kind of the last push over the edge that benedict needed to fill in uh that kind of spot and so he's like 
all right you know what fuck it i'm i'm gonna kill my best friend uh and he decides that right at the very start of the scene in my head and so to me he his line of uh where is it uh she says kill claudio and then he says ha not for the wide world and in steph's like direction of the show that line is delivered sincerely uh benedict will not kill claudio in my head benedict delivers the line sincerely and then turns and winks to the audience <laughs> as though like oh hell yeah i'm gonna kill claudio i just want to get her mad at me first <laughs> and so then she launches into this tirade and the whole time he is like uh downstage from her she is upstage taking the focus in this rant and he's like egging her on oh but beatrice no let's no beatrice no you know and like he's feeding this like constantly the whole time now here's a question for you yeah is your thought changed by um what i told you on the latest episode of protest too much out everywhere you get your podcasts uh, about the definition of a comedy in Shakespeare. No. Okay. Uh, I still think that that uh, like to me and this I think is, is a lot of like maybe my, my own interpretation of medieval audiences. Uh, I just don't think they're going to sit through this whole scene uh and have fun with it if they were promised a comedy and they show up and it's like heavy and sad and weird so for all y'all out there um a comedy an, a shakespearean comedy is defined as a play that ends in weddings there does not have to be anything funny about it um it, comedy was not used in like a comedy descriptor for a play was not used in the overarching same sense. It's just, if people end up dead, it's a tragedy. If people end up married, it's a comedy. Um, so yes, the comedies tend to be much lighter and more romance centric than the tragedies do. But um, I think that's because, because this, uh, what's up, Kurt? Um, because this play is so full of funny moments to me you've earned this scene because this whole like act four scene one start to finish starting with the wedding um even with the like uncomfortable kind of chuckling that happens at the the beginning of the wedding scene like you have run so fast and so hard for three full acts doing physical comedy bit after physical comedy bit after physical comedy bit you've got beatrice and benedict hiding in the hiding in the garden and jumping into moats and you've got you are hammering the audience with bits and jokes and wit that like you've earned this scene certainly and i totally buy that right uh but i also uh i come from a like a thought like i mean ace ventura is one of my favorite movies is growing it really? up really growing up yeah like that <laughs> that like that was such a basis of my comedy right is like just oh ludicrous breakneck speed <laughs> like does not stop right and like that to me is was like a hallmark of of like comedic achievement when i was younger right and so like if that is my my mentality like i mean the movie did not age uh well to like in the least right but that style of comedy uh the the hot rod style the like whatever whatever movie you want to pick that is just start to finish bonkers right if i'm if i'm approaching a shakespeare play with the same level of uh comedy that i'm trying to find and i've got all this stuff backing me up throughout the rest of the script i think that's where that's where my take comes from i do think uh steph's interpretation makes for a much better play as far as like a a theater experience kind of uh fully fleshed out fully rounded out uh would be 
but if you're trying to hit like uh start to finish funny um it's a very easy scene to make funny through my interpretation of the scene so swan i want to hear your initial zero context thoughts <laughs> uh, like clearly we're on mike and i are on like like opposite sides of the planet for <laughs> this scene well and i it's kind of fun because i i know it in context of it being a comedy and so again i will admit that in my brain i automatically think that like some of these scenes are meant to be funny and you know we've talked about it before but i i'm a softy for jane austen so the the people who hate each other turning into lovers like i am on board with that so i like the idea of benedict like ribbing her and being a little shitty and being like i'm gonna needle you because i know you're pissed um which is really funny to read not funny to experience um i enjoy it when it happens to people who are not me um that's comedy if it happens to you it's tragedy <laughs> right you're right so <laughs> i like that part of it um but also not knowing a ton of depth about the characters i can also see like yes it's comical at the start because a huge disaster just happened at this wedding but at the same time like this is someone she cares about and i could see like i will you know all right so you say you love me so kill him like here's my gauntlet i'll play your game for a little bit and then when you say no i'm not playing along with the joke anymore now i'm actually pissed and this serious thing that I was covering with comedy, I'm not covering anymore. And now I'm just mad at you. And you can think that you're still playing, but I'm not playing anymore. So that's that's how that felt to me. Cause he comes in like, no, no, like I'm gonna lighten the mood and it's gonna be chill and everything's gonna be fine. She's like, okay, prove it. And I li like, I like that. And I like that feeling like, again, they are equals in their conversation. So while they're coming at it from different motivations and different, like she's saying, setups, like she can't go and kill Claudio, um, but even just they are sparring at the same level. And I don't think you get that from like their interactions with other people in the play. Like they have that specific sparring, which makes the chemistry, which makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. So I like that conflict. So I think that's a fun kind of middle ground to take where like if you take your what I don't, so I think what I dislike about your interpretation is after he sees how it sets her off, I don't, like, I think as a character, even, like, if the scene is, is tongue-in-cheek farce, like, taking it as a, like, all those, like, Beatrice, Beatrice, like, oh, God, I was kidding. I, I'm so sorry I was kidding, instead of, like, a, <laughs> like, kind of interrupting. <laughs> um, So, like, taking it, like, if he's, like, taken it as a joke and pushes the bit forward because he doesn't know when to stop with a bit um and then like sees how it sets her off like right. kind of balancing it in that way to kind of and that's what i was out. thinking there like swan brought it out that like it can be both <laughs> and like where that turn is i think is what makes that interaction super interesting right because if it's if it's the first like the first time he's trying to jump in should like he probably still doesn't get it right, right. uh but i think by the time by the time she launches into the big one of princes and counties such princely testimony da, 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 like that i feel like is the perfect opportunity for benedict to realize oh no uh swan you've got a couple bots in here oh as much as yeah. i really do want big follows i do want to be famous how did you know uh well and something i was gonna say is uh, let's see if i can get them sorry i cannot multitask uh, if you would just make us mod swan <laughs> we could do this for you don't make me a mod because i still honestly don't know how to ban people i've seen them come up in the add channel and i'm in a, a mod on that and i'm like well i hope someone else gets it because i still can't figure it out <laughs> i am uh, as you're seeing right now i am very slow at it uh so that's how that goes all right i think i'm good um oh but what i was gonna say is i almost wonder 
Yeah, okay. So it's still going to show up in their show. All right. Sorry. I almost wonder, and this was something that you got me thinking about when we did the scene in the woods between the king and queen. And it was, like, in this one, Benedict, like, thinking through and responding and almost getting to a point where he's like, can't you see how ridiculous this is, though? Like, you're getting real pissed and what level you're at. Like, I almost feel like he's sitting back and waiting for her to to have her logic part kick in. And I think that's a a big ask in that moment. Like, yeah, right. no, and it's easy for him to be removed from it and why he can kind of keep going in the manner that he is rather than, like, outwardly being an asshole, but just like, no, no, you see how ridiculous this ask is, right? Like, we're on the same page, and she's like, we're super not. So... <laughs> Right. Like, and it's that lack of like, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Just that, like, you know, him taking a little bit longer to pick up on and them to get to the same page. Mm -hmm. And it, they're never going to be on the same page because he cannot understand what it's like to live in a world where he can't do what he wants. Or like, you know, like he can go up and challenge Claudio. Beatrice cannot. So the like that's one of the things that i the, honestly that speech and that like last little bit of beatrice's is what makes me love this scene so much is when she is um uh oh that i were a man for his sake or had any friend who would be a man for my sake i cannot be a man with wishing therefore i will die a woman with grieving like she is so powerless and she has just watched the only person that she's ever loved in her life, her cousin, be publicly humiliated, um, thrown down at the altar of her wedding. Like, there is no lower situation Beatrice could ever imagine herself in. And so to bring it up with that, like, final, like, or, like, that finally they've admitted that they love each other, and then, like, this is her only hope. He is the only thing that can get her that can like make this right he is mm -hmm. the only person in the world that can make this right and like i don't think benedict could ever understand where she's coming from there which makes a, a lot of sense of why he would take it lightly because like that's probably like a, a good old you know like army army bro jokes like <laughs> oh yeah why don't you go challenge that guy to a fight like why don't you go duel that guy you know guaranteed yeah. yeah, like uh, I was never in the armed services, uh, but I was in the hardcore scene <laughs> and we absolutely would challenge each other to fights as a joke. And then all of a sudden it wasn't a joke anymore. And then someone was going to the hospital like that is very uh, classic toxic masculinity. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, I just think it's and I. I know we're talking about them like they're real people. They're very real people to me. <laughs> um, but like, I think that's one of the best things about Shakespeare is that it is so like, you're allowed to bring your experiences to the table in a way that like totally changes the feel and temperature of a scene. And I have never, nobody's ever said, what if he's joking to me before Mike? And like, I love that. I love the, even if I don't like it, <laughs> like even if I don't like the choice, it's such a, it's such a different perspective. And I think that, that Shakespeare is so open to so many different perspectives that like, that's one of the things that I love so much about it. And yeah, like it, to me, it was impossible to figure out like how, how a dude goes from, this is my sworn brother to this is my sworn enemy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so like he couldn't, he just didn't. And I had never considered that because to me, he said no. And he saw how much pain she was in. And he said, yes, like that to me was an easy shift. And, and I never yeah. saw it from your like process. And so like, I, I also, uh, reading this play, have a very different interpretation of Beatrice and Benedict's uh, end relationship uh, than Steph does. Um, 
because of the way that like i i don't think either of them are good people <laughs> and i don't think either of them deserve happiness and i don't think either of them uh truly love anyone but themselves this is the first time i've ever heard him say this <laughs> he's been saving this one <laughs> female's got a good question in chat <laughs> Who's better? That was incredible. Marlowe or Shakespeare? What a great question, female. You don't want to talk about that? What a great question. Mike, <laughs> who's better, Marlowe or Shakespeare? Uh, my friend Sarah has a cat named Marlowe. Um, and I just, I the thing about the cat, right, is that it's so self-absorbed and it's so focused on its own desires. Swan, who's better, Marlowe or Shakespeare? So I I was afraid of this. <laughs> who Mar who's Marlowe? Like what do I know them so from? Christopher Marlowe wrote um was a a contemporary of Shakespeare. Uh, I think the play you would know is Doctor Faustus, uh, all the devils and the selling your soul for. So would you rather sell your soul <laughs> to a to a devil for three wishes? <laughs> That's the plot of Faustus, but whatever. <laughs> would you rather sell your soul to the devil for three wishes, or? Would you rather fall in love as a good person with another good person and be happy for the rest of your life? <laughs> I mean, I you know, I'm a romantic at heart, so I'm usually gonna pick fall in love and then through it all end up in hell. So, you know, we'll just we'll get, get the whole thing. <laughs> Kurt brings up a great question in chat. What are the wish rules? Uh Standard genie wish rules. Oh, mm. uh, you're gonna get you're gonna no get wishing for more wishes, huh? <laughs> no wishing for more wishes. Also, is this a monkey paw situation, or do I actually get what I want? Also, oh, be da yeah. be dazzled is a great movie. It is an underrated movie. Like it really it, is. Uh, I enjoy that movie very much. Um, Swan, talk to us about your approach to art. Here, <laughs> just completely. I'll get to you. I just feel like we haven't talked about art yet. So we're oh, that's how you know she's gonna be a good producer. Keep the talent happy. Uh so uh so this one's fun. So again, you know, as we've talked about now a few times, because it's an opening shot for me, I'm always starting with like my my wider shot, my my intro where you're getting you're setting the scenes and, and getting into it. So, you know, I definitely want in my brain, this is a very small wedding just because i feel like that was how the shakespeare weddings were like they weren't always huge affairs i could be completely they did wrong. not have a lot of actors to pay for ensemble right so but i kind of like then like this idea of you know not necessarily a big barn wedding but kind of that like rustic outdoorsy you know homemade type wedding so you know opening it up with with the bride at the altar you know grieving and you know just seeing people in silhouette but you can kind of see that people are up and they're milling around and that something was supposed to happen and it's not happening and because this is going to have so much charged dialogue between these two main characters i want to try and delay the side-by-side -side shots of their face talking for as long as i can which i know sounds weird because i do have it set up here but I want to, because there is so much dialogue, I want to set them up, honestly, with props. I want something for their hands to hold. I want somewhere for them to move to. So in the second panel, I'm trying to establish that you can see that Beatrice is looking onto this scene and absorbing it. And you have Benedict coming from, from the background and moving forward. So now they have a place to go. You know, I think in my brain, like she's not going to have this fight in front of the other people. So you need a place for her to relocate to when she's chewing his ass. And also like, again, because it's a wedding and you've got drinks, like that sets it up where if I wanna have her throw the liquid at him, I've got that there. And you've got him, like you've got movement of him being able to set his drink down so that he can gesture with both hands when he's trying to emphasize what he's talking about. And that it lets you have the characters have secondary action that doesn't necessarily take away from anything that they're saying. Like obviously the dialogue is the important part and like their facial expressions, but this makes it feel more human. And it's not just 
panel here, panel here, one person talking to the other person, and then another panel, and another panel. So I like that they kind of, like, they're moving through this space and interacting with it as well, but it's not really telling the story. So I think cool. that's really cool. As an actor, <laughs> I love hearing that you, you write, like you make a comic panel in the same way that a director blocks a scene. Because like, honestly, that's almost exactly the blocking that we used for Much Ado when we did this at the, like at the park, uh, like, Benedict comes from as far like as far downstage or far upstage in the back. In the back upstage. Yeah, uh, <laughs> as far upstage as he can, uh, like possibly be to Beatrice, who's all the way downstage by the end of it. And then everyone else kind of like fades off, uh, fades off like uh, into the wings. Uh, and like it's structured so similarly to how this like plays out in in this comic panel that's so sick that makes yeah me um the idea of grinding yourself with props i think is such a cool because it is such an actor thing it's um, like improv 101 improv it, yeah it really <laughs> is an improv thing which is you know where mike and i are both trained in acting is a start of improv right so i think that and i i love that you are you're building up tension. Like it's like a Chekhov's gun thing. Like if there's a gun on the wall, someone's going to use it. Um, if there's a glass of champagne in an emotional <laughs> scene, someone's going to throw it. Yeah. So I think that's a, like, I think setting that up is a really, really cool um, use of, of visual props. Oh, All right. And it's funny because it's, I like it because I, I've only ever been a part of like stage productions and a lot of that is dance. And so obviously when you are setting the stage and dance and doing all that, the story that we're telling is through a lot of the movement. So we, we take up the whole stage and we move in and out of that space in a very specific way because we don't have to stand in front of the audience and address them and speak. We, for those four minutes, we get up and we dance and that's how we tell that part of the story. So the blocking is very different, but it's fun to me to see like, Oh no, like these things that make sense to me and how I would lay out a page actually translate to how you would take it in a stage fashion. A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the worst improv in the world is when it's two people standing still talking to each other, <laughs> uh, literally doing anything with your body is more enjoyable than that. Right. Uh, just like, our one arm up holding a <laughs> holding a fake uh bus railing right and every once in a while your body shifts and now it's an interesting scene like that's it that's all it takes is like the littlest bit of interaction with a world around you and then you've got so much more to work with um i feel very james bond from <laughs> the tone of your of your piece so far uh, oh, okay. And maybe it's just this panel on the left, like, or like the, you know, the fact that we've got suits happening and champagne and that feels very James Bond to me. It's a very yeah. swanky, uh, much ado. I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> much different from ours, which was a like nineties, uh, <laughs> it was just like a frat party. It was like a nineties frat party. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It felt like if you took, uh, empire records <laughs> and like space jam. Yeah. And put them together. <laughs> like it was so 90s. Which like for me, because so the the thing about this play is um, I ran a company in New England and we put on a park show every year in this the most beautiful, the most beautiful park um, out outdoors, surrounded by a moat with a gazebo in the middle and these like fairy bridges connecting it like the most beautiful space. And then I moved to Denver and the park emailed me at the usual time and was like okay so we'll see you next year and i was like yes <laughs> yes you will um and then i had to figure out how to put on a play from across the country so i emailed all my actors and i was like hey audition for this play we're gonna meet a couple times on zoom um we're gonna have one day of rehearsal 
and then it's going to be a park show. And we did it. And it was like, so I couldn't costume it. I couldn't do any like real thematic costuming because every, it was like, everyone wear your most nineties thing. <laughs> and like, everyone has nineties things. We had uh, people singing nineties music throughout the whole show. Um, oh live band singing nineties music. <laughs> uh, we had Zima. We had empty bottles of Zima and Surge. <laughs> um, and that was our, that was our theme. Cause I wanted it to feel like a party. Uh, cause it was this, like, you know, we have one shot to do this. It probably will crash and burn, but like, we're going to try. And it was actually amazing, but that's due to the actors, not due to any <laughs> situational, uh, thing, but yeah, it was a very, very frat vibe. It was um, so fun. I think Vio by Kurt says that he got a Vegas nightclub rat pack era vibe. And I can Ooh. see that. Okay. Yeah. And I think the crossover, I think when whenever you have someone in a tux like suit, that crossover is gonna be possible. Yeah, pretty strong. Yeah. yeah. All right, Mike, tell me why you hate Beatrice and Benedict so much. And I'm gonna <laughs> listen with an with an open mind and an open heart. Uh all right. So we open on this play where we've got two over the hill middle-aged ish people who do nothing but insult each other. Uh, they're young protégés. Neither of them want to be like their mentor. And both of them find love and get happy and settle down almost immediately, almost as a like, oh God, if I don't, what if I end up like him? Right? Uh, like Claudio meets Hero mm. and is instantly like, oh, I can avoid becoming Benedict. And he, he like Hero is like, oh, I don't have to become old and bitter. <laughs> and like then Beatrice Beatrice and Benedict are just old and bitter at each other for like three full acts. <laughs> uh everyone makes them both the butt of their jokes for the entire first half of the play. They finally agree in this scene uh, that, you know what? Maybe we should stop being so shitty to each other. Because other people had a chance at happiness and it was dashed. Like, it's. It's so fraught with, like, I don't want to die alone. <laughs> when I said I should uh, when I said I should die a bachelor. It's only because I never imagined living long enough to see myself married or whatever yeah, Benedict's yeah. line is, right? Uh, is like, he's convincing himself that, you know what, maybe maybe this isn't all that bad. Uh, and there's, there's something in it for me uh, if I have somebody to grow old with instead of being alone. And it like, it doesn't, I think you can read it in a way that's like, oh, no, this is really sweet. But uh, the the first time I read this play was definitely two old grouchy people uh, deciding to retire together. Like, <laughs> So there is a production of this play. Does it take place in a nursing home? Because I like 100% could see that. It's James Earl Jones and Vanessa Redgrave. Oh. Yeah, and it's it was recent too. I'm trying to pull oh, up that's what so year it was. Good. Like, yeah, um, that's really good. But like really recent. Like, and you can God, they're so um uh let me do let me do this. Cause like seeing their old faces <laughs> um is just a really cool. So look at that. That's Benedict and Beatrice. Yeah. Like, wow. And like, first of all, getting to see aged love on stage is really special in and of itself um, because you just don't get that representation often. Uh, but like, look how old he is. Look how old <laughs> everyone is, <laughs> except for, you know, the right. sweet young things. And like, I love this concept because I think that. And again, I don't, yeah, they're kind of like Beatrice and Benedict are like Statler and Waldorf. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> that's exactly it. Like uh, neither of them are super happy with the other, but that's where they are now. This is my life now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's definitely a, a fair interpretation of the characters. Like that is not even something that I could fight. Um, I think it's totally fair. I obviously see a lot of um, personal similarity in these characters that makes it difficult for me to say they're just bad people who don't deserve happiness. Um, <laughs> but to each his own. Like realistically, uh, Benedict does nothing good for anyone until he decides to kill his best friend. <laughs> that is the first good thing that he does in the play. Beatrice is at least nice to Hero. But like also is super mean to everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You gotta you gotta work through your trauma some way. <laughs> um so here's what I want to Swan, here's what I want to ask you that I was most um curious about with this scene. Because we've got so much tone shift in this scene. It starts out uh boy why are you crying <laughs> like that's how it starts out like hey beatrice you're sit literally sitting in the corner sobbing um hey you've been crying the whole time you or just like did you just start like are you almost done, <laughs> you almost done crying? <laughs> where are you at on this crying thing because i wanted to talk about something else um yeah it starts so low and then it gets to this like I love you with so much of my heart. There is none left to protest. Like it is peak. Um, I don't know if it's peak happiness, but it's like peak romance. Peak for sure. romance. Yeah. Absolutely. Like find me, uh, find me a better love line than I do love nothing in the world so well as you. Is not that strange? Like how weird <laughs> is that? <laughs> <laughs> and then so it's it's peak sad peak romance and then peak frustration and like everything about her situation is is frustrated like she can't do what she wants to do and what she needs to do um and then you've got this like really tepid resolution to the scene because it it just kind of ends he's like okay like we don't go back to the romance we don't go back to the sadness we don't go back to the frustration we just kind of end like we've been here 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 and then we just kind of end here. Uh, because she asks him to kill his best friend and he has to go do that now. For Benedict, <laughs> it does not end here. Like it is, that is not a middle, that is not a middle ending for him. That is like, okay, uh, you have been uncomfortable. You have been in love. You have been shocked. You have been humored. You have been like on the defensive and now, you're building up rage to go murder somebody like he doesn't leave that middle ground. And I get from your perspective, because you're like, your focus is entirely Beatrice in yeah. this, uh, like almost the whole play, right? Because that's who you attach to. Uh, there are two people in this scene and the other one has the like opposite arc that be that Beatrice does. Because like know, Beatrice honestly. starts starts here in my like in my reading of the scene. She starts here. She starts middle. Okay. Uh, because like, yeah, she's sad. And then like Benedict distracts her and she like lifts up a little, and then she gets very serious, and then she gets pissed. And then at the end, like she's accepting i assume she's got to be accepting the fact that she just condemned a dude to death mm -hmm. like and so for me i read this scene very differently from like emotional levels uh because my focus is on the other character in the scene sure but you agree that it is a roller coaster yes a hundred percent when so when you are when you're drawing and it's a single page because I know that that you know you can use uh, color and 
all like obviously facial expressions, but like what are the ways that you change like what are the ways that you can change tone drastically like on a on a dime? Uh so I think so this is something interesting that happens in I learned it on an animation side of that. And that is thinking about the characters in silhouette. So if you don't have the benefit of, we'll say even dialogue or color or facial expressions, what do their silhouettes say to you? So at this point, like I'm really trying to think about the fact like, you know, Benedict has kind of like a little bit of swagger, like he's leaning in, whereas she's, she's very tight, very pulled in. And like, then as it progresses and he starts to, you know, be on the defense, you're going to see him kind of pull back a little bit and, and stand back and she's going to start to open up more. And you're going to see more of that, like that leaning forward and that aggression. And you're going to see it in their silhouettes, which then makes it even better when I actually have the space to add facial features, but you're going to see that, like that intensity and the, whereas they're kind of moving as, like pains at this point, like seeing pains like a flat standy or something like that. Like they're kind of doing that right now and they're kind of not interacting. Once it starts to get heated, you're going to see them facing each other more and leaning into that and then that kind of reaction to build up. You might also, I say you, I might also, you know, consider doing some tighter shots where you're really coming in on, on their faces. And that also is emphasizing that whatever was whatever else was happening in the world has completely faded away and it doesn't matter because we're in this fight now. And that's the important thing. And I think as you, as you kind of zoom in, it makes it feel a little bit more claustrophobic, which ups the intensity and ups the, the tension a little bit more. And then you get to play with, like I would pull back for a scene like when one of them takes a breath or when one of them has that before they're getting ready to go at the next hit like that's when you kind of pull back to a little bit and you get like that medium shot of like okay and that's that breather before you either continue or because before there's a different resolution to it um and so like you're using the confines of the panels as well as the actual like silhouettes of the characters inside them to use that body language that reads to the audience as stress or strain or anger or that type of stuff. And then, you know, then like we've said, you know, I'm I'm obviously working in a monochromatic thing because <laughs> that's easier for me, but to add, like, I would up the shadows. I would darken out the background. I would do, you know, I'd probably bring more like reds and oranges because that just feels like anger to people. And then, you know, back that off from there. But yeah, so all of those things working and so together. That's something like shadows, I think is interesting because it's not um it's not something that's going to be in focus it's not like all of a sudden the whole color story has changed but you've just like upped the shadow amount a little bit and now like it's it's almost like tricking the viewer right or the reader or like because we feel more overwhelmed or we feel more uh we feel darker we feel cloudier even though it's not like a, a total it's not like someone turned off the lights it's right. just you're building up different shadows. Yeah, and I, again, you talk about if you are in, if you aren't outside and you're actually in a confined theater, you know, moving towards more of a follow spot rather than a well-lit stage so that you're really, you are laser focusing the audience in on these two characters and literally everything else fades away. And it's that same idea, like, no, you really want to to focus in on them because that's where that tension is. And you don't want anybody else paying attention to anything else. Let me tell you about follow spots. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've done a lot of lighting design. Um, we never had, we were never rich enough for a follow spot. Like, let's just get that out there right away. Um, so I don't actually have, I have some experience with spots and stuff, but um, for most stuff I did, a uh, very, very limited budget. And I think that lighting design for a play is like one of the, the most important, I know it's all important, but like when you have really good lighting design, you shouldn't notice it at all. Yeah. Um, and it can totally change a play. Uh, my favorite 
essentially follow spot my my spotlight story is when i uh did lighting design for beauty and the beast and like the whole you know the beast changes into the prince or whatever and you know you've got the music building and building and building and that is that da, na, 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 and he stands up and he's a human and he's you know whatever and so i've you know plotted out this all this stuff and it's dark on stage and there's all stuff happening and our prince da, na, na, half in the light and half <laughs> in the darkness so he's literally standing like this like i am on my camera right now marks are suggestions steph yeah. i don't understand what your problem is i was in the booth just like <laughs> no oh god that's so stressful to me that's, oh I would have just, lost it. Just scooch. Please scooch. Please, please, please scooch. Um why? <laughs> it sounds like he half nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Oh my god. I was so I was like, Aah! but like lighting design is so cool in that way that that it really can you shouldn't have noticed. Like you should have just like noticed him in the spotlight. That's like that's the impact and that's the moment. There's so much lighting can do that creates those moments um, without being like, oh, look at those well-placed blues behind this bright white spot, you know? Um, but when, you know, half your arm is just in blue, it's not. Oh, gosh. Actors, am I right? Um, <laughs> God, they're so stupid. But it definitely, so it's it's Who let those people on stage anyway? It's interesting to do park shows because now in a couple of years, that's all I've put together is park shows, um, which saves a lot of money on theater space rental. But it's a total, you have to direct a totally different show. Yeah. Um, because for me, I, this will surprise probably nobody, but like, I'm a very dark director. I am a, I like the dark stuff. <laughs> I like it internal. I like it uh, thoughtful. I like it depressing. I like it. I want to make you cry. <laughs> um, that's my like goal. Um, and like, I want that nuance because I typically dislike ham. I think there's a place for ham. I think there's absolutely a place for him. And I think Shakespeare is a great place for him because it's stupid and it's dick jokes for two hours. Um, That's what I'm saying. Right. <laughs> and I, I get that. And directing for a park show, you, you're not getting nuance in a park show because you have no access to lighting or, you know, like design. Um, there was a lot of subtext when I was singing My Heart Will Go On. It's uh, just, yeah. <laughs> for the record. Uh, in case anyone didn't know, there's a point where Benedict is like trying to put together a love song or whatever. And I was like, Mike, how do you feel about Celine Dion? <laughs> she, go she goes, I asked her, I was like, what is the melody to this song that I'm supposed to sing? And she goes, I don't know, make it up. And so I just started singing it to the tune of my heart will go on. And she goes, well, I guess you figured it out. Uh <laughs> um, not a lot of nuance, in a park show. <laughs> which I think there's, I, I really love, I love that. I love, you know, just giving people a show and enjoyment and I want it to feel like a party. Um, but the designer part of me is like, mm, I want you to feel things and I want to manipulate all of your emotions. I want to control your feelings. <laughs> so it's like, I imagine as an artist, you're kind of the same, right? <laughs> I very much want to control their feelings and I want to play with them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like, I know, Mike, you laughed, but like, that's basically your job. Right? <laughs> well, and it's, it's funny too, because again, you do the similarities between acting. If this were a movie, I feel like you can play it a lot more subtle because you can zoom in yeah. as much as you want on Beatrix, Beatrice's face and see the sadness. And if you've got a good actress, you can see that full range of emotion. With a stage play, 
you know, you're going to be set back from that. So it's got to be bigger anyways. And with a comic, like, I think about the fact that there are a lot of people who are reading the word bubbles and only secondarily absorbing the art. So I can put in slight facial expressions, slight things, but they're not going to read necessarily. And while I can't always go over the top and everything because it'll lose some of its punch, I can't be so subtle that it's missed. Like if she's upset, like I can show her looking pissed and also trying to make it look like she's sad as well, but I have to at least make her look pissed because that has to read and that has to translate. So there is a, a bigger level to it that has to happen a little bit because I do, I need the audience to feel something and I need to, again, manipulate them in that way that they're invested and they're engaged in this moment that's happening. But like just in the picture that you have there of her face, like there's such a story there because having the having the makeup down her cheeks, um, we know that she's been crying and now she's transitioned into anger. Like you don't need to show her sitting in a corner crying because you've already shown the like the effects of that. So that's such a cool way to kind of um, tell tell a whole story in just a single expression. And I wonder if that's like, is there a way to do that um, for characters who wouldn't wear makeup? Like, what are other like ways that you can kind of show emotional stories in just a snapshot? So it's, it's interesting. And this is, this is something funny. And I mean, obviously, as each person has their own art style, people choose to, to show it differently. But there is something and this was, again, because my background is a lot in animation, and then moving into comics. Uh, the more lines that you add on a character's face, the older they're going to look. So if you have like those lines around your mouth or any of the pinch lines around your eyes, any of that, or like if you're tensing your jaw and you show that line, any of that is going to age up the character a little bit. So usually like if you're drawing little kids who are screaming, you'll see a bigger mouth and bigger eyes and that type of stuff because you need to keep them young. The kind of second part addendum to that is you can get away with adding a lot of lines to male characters' faces and it makes them look more rugged, tougher, angrier, this. When you are drawing, we'll say a beautiful female character, the more lines you add to her, the more she gets into like evil witch in the swamp territory. And you start to lose that nuance of emotion on her face and you just start to focus on her actually almost being aged up. So if I'm drawing a guy who's obviously not, in this case, most likely not gonna be wearing makeup, so you're not gonna have that element to it, I can add, like more stress lines under his eyes. I can add that harsh jawline because that actually works in his benefit as far as a visual goes. Whereas if I were to do that with her, it would make her look more masculine or older. So it would change that. So that's kind of a weird balancing act. So like, you know, when you look at the Hulk, when he's fully hulked out, he's got this tiny little nose, but there is so much of the musculature happening between his eyebrows and down his cheeks. And when he's raging, like you'll see the veins in his neck and all of that. And you can do that. But you look at like when she Hulk hulks out, she's drawn very differently and she still looks powerful, but it's handled in a very so different way. angled. Yeah. <laughs> like she's so angled and smooth and like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I like in comics is when they close up on just the eyes and you get like this much right and like the story that artists can tell when this is what they're working with instead <laughs> of like a whole face is just so sick right if you're looking for a subtle shift like that's where you see it is like you've got a you've got a frame like this for benedict where he's like smirking or whatever and then the close up of the eyes where like you see a smize or whatever when he's like egging her on, right? That's when you know, oh, he's taking the piss right now. And like it gives you that insight that she as a character misses because she's not hyper focused like the audience is on his micro expressions. Yeah. And like it it almost works like a magnifying glass, right? Like uh zoomed in on this one little section. Yeah, yeah, I love I those, those cut out cool. eyes. I love those. Yeah, kind of they're they're so fun. 
they're so like and it's so arresting visually when it's just like superimposed over two or three other panels right because it can go wherever the hell you want it to go that's the thing that like i never get is like swan you talked about it uh, a couple of weeks ago where like you're working on like this s curve back and forth mm -hmm. right uh as we read through the panel and those eyes can go wherever the hell you want them to wherever you want that like insight to live question for you in a general comic setup um when you turn the page do you wash your hands <laughs> when you when you turn the page do you look at the right page first or the left page first like right when you turn the page what's the first thing that you are going to see whether you linger on it or not so so i'll actually tell you so my plan with this is i i actually want to continue it onto a second page just because there is so much there so if this were going to be a print comic which is how i think about it um this would be page one so this would be a page that happens on the right hand side and it would just be a single page by itself so the next flip that's going to happen is going to open up to a double spread and because I'm trained, it's hard for me to say that because I automatically look to the top left because that's where my brain goes. But what my plan is for this, spoilers, is on the next page, the very top left, what I'm setting up and I want to set up is her actually throwing the drink into his face. So it's going to be this big pop and it's going to be a burst of not only action, but not color, but higher contrast in that top left so that even if that's not where your eye naturally would go it's going to do everything in my power to pull your eye there because that's the moment that i want i can play with everything else across the two pages after that but i want you there and i want you there as soon as i can get you as soon as you turn the page so yeah. some of that is again if this was not such such a tense scene between the two of them and if it was just regular conversation there's a chance that on the next page i would pull out again and have them walking somewhere or talking or do like an overhead shot if i was going to introduce new characters like there are other things i can do but because i'm literally trying to build the tension of this specific scene like that's what i want to probably have a bigger panel right at the top that brings you right there and then takes you through the rest of the page yeah um, like I'm not experienced in reading comics, but I was talking about this with someone recently. Um, and they were saying they were given a suggestion to put the, uh, bigger events to make sure that the more impactful events were on the right hand page, because I think that's right. I think that was the advice that they were given. Um, but that feels as a reader uh i feel like i always naturally am drawn to the first thing that i see as i'm like turning the pages and so that would be kind of like middle right page uh always and then i have to remind myself oh i gotta i can't get there yet you know and i have to snap yeah. myself back up to the top left no and that's legit and that's a that's a, a i don't want to say conflict but that's kind of a fight when it comes mm -hmm. to designing it and that's why it's important and what I think is cool, because there's a lot of different ways that you can produce comics now, um, but if you're reading this digitally um, and you're clicking through, they can kind of control you a little bit more with what you see and you'll only see it a page at a time. But if because I still think in print medium, because that's how I read comics, I know that people are going to want to look to that right hand side because that's the end of the next two pages and that's where the thing is going to happen because you, I need you to turn the page. That's where I've got to have something there that makes you want to turn the page. So I'm fighting that like almost like undertow, pulling you towards that right side. So if I need you on the top left, then I've got to get you there and I've got to give you reason to be there. So. Yeah. Uh, I think it was, you know, a question that I was like, I have no input on this because I don't know. <laughs> um, but I thought it was an interesting conversation to have because thinking about, yeah, it's not just when you turn the page at what it's what also makes you turn to the next page. Um, so like, how do you keep that momentum going? And that has got to be such a hard job, like keeping that momentum up page after page after page after page. Is it exhausting? <laughs> so, so this is funny um, for me because obviously we're working with text 
that already works really well for this, like it just moves. It has a great movement to it. Like it already works. So that hard part is done for me. I don't have to stress about that. One, because I don't write. And two, because I, you know, I didn't have a writer first time trying this out or something like that. So it's already written well. And then it's just up to me to kind of break it down from there. When it comes to like some of the anthologies that I, I work on, we only have eight pages. We have eight pages to tell this entire little snippet of a story. So there's a lot of information that has to get packed into those eight pages to not only set the scene, introduce the characters, set up the conflict, kind of have some action, resolve the conflict, and then be done. So those are a lot more strategically laid out because they have to be. But if you've got a long running series, especially if you already know the characters, like people who pick up X-Men comics, they're curious about what hijinks they're going to get into. I don't necessarily need to keep their attention every single page. I want to because that's a part of reading and, and enjoying comics. But if you just have a lot of dialogue before they're, they're gearing up for their next battle, you're not going to lose people because they're waiting for that next battle. So you've got them along and you can, you have the benefit then of switching either between groups of characters or different scenes or stuff like that. So yes and no. And a lot of that, a lot of that is often taken off of my plate by the writers and the editors. Like they'll go through a lot of stuff before it ever gets to me. Um, as far as my actual, setting up stuff but i've had you know two different sides of writers really one side detailing everything they want in a panel top of the page bottom of the page giving me total breakdowns of how they see it playing out but i've also had people who are like this is what we need to accomplish on this page got it up to you how you want to do it but this is what i need to accomplish this is the dialogue that needs to happen this is they need to start inside and by the time they're done they both need to be standing outside on either side of this car so those i find are a little bit they're fun but those are a little bit more challenging because then it's okay how do i want to tell the most engaging story but like <laughs> this is part of the artist insanity where that challenge is part of the fun like sure. okay so you know here's the very here's my first rough draft of the very basic way that i can tell this all right now what's a little bit more fun What's a more fun angle? What makes sense for this? Or like, oh, how could I spin this? How could I twist this? How could I make this more fun, not just to draw, but to read? And like, I like that challenge because I'm an insane person. <laughs> well, so I think that's, yeah, I, I mean, I, it happens for theater too. Like, how do I make people care about the next scene? Um, especially, and for me in Shakespeare, a lot of that is editing. Um, <laughs> a lot of it is chopping out a lot of unnecessary stuff because there is a lot of fluff in Shakespeare and I don't want to speak for everyone, but like a four hour Shakespeare play does not sound like my idea of a great time. <laughs> Just yeah. I, some people it is. Kenneth Branagh has a four hour Hamlet and people have watched it. I have watched it. Um, I won't. It's just <laughs> I, I would say I'm not going to watch the four hour Justice League, so I'm probably not going to watch the four hour Hamlet either. Shit, I wasn't going to watch the hour and a half Justice League. Uh... <laughs> I didn't. No desire. <laughs> um, and I want to talk a little bit about kind of why the fact that this scene moves and why this scene moves so well to me. Um, but Mike, if you want to, Mike's got to head out in just a few minutes um unless you wanted to stick around but if you want to let people know again where they can find your stuff sure yeah uh you can find me at future x skeleton on twitter uh i've got adventure inc podcast a fifth edition actual play podcast where uh we get up to some shakespearean plots uh and comic book action um and you know in general uh have a pretty good time uh we have a new season coming up soon uh, I am very fortunate to have some uh, incredible work coming uh, as far as my character art is concerned from a very talented, amazing friend of mine uh, <laughs> that I cannot wait to reveal. Uh, also, I do a show called uh, Ask the Pokedexpert where I talk about Pokemon as though they're real. Uh, spoiler alert, y'all. I don't know anything about Pokemon. Uh, I know less about Pokemon than I know about Shakespeare. Um, and I also do a view style ripoff of in addition, 
called uh, <laughs> Almost Daily Discourse every Wednesday night on twitch.tv slash almost daily pod. Uh, thank you all both so much for having me on the show. Uh, this was so, so, so much fun. I love this scene. Uh, I love this play. And I love both of you. Aw. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, I just, I'm gonna go probably on a roll on this. So I wanted to make sure that <laughs> I gave him room. <laughs> so I wasn't kind of talking through his appointment. Um, here's why, here's one of the reasons that I think this scene uh, moves so well. And um, the first two, oh, that's not what I wanted. The first two scenes we did for sketching Shakespeare, and I want to know if, like, Swan, do you feel like it? Do you feel like in general, because you've mentioned a couple times that this one moves, do you feel like it moves better or differently than the first couple we looked at? So it's like it's also a longer piece, so it's hard to. Yeah, so I think that might be part of it. It's funny to me because the Tempest piece has a lot more actual action like physical action. There's a lot more happening. Um, and it's funny because with that one, I was so hyper-focused on kind of getting to that very last box, the, the last like panel, because that had the the great line. And like, so a lot of that was like, I want this frenzy and stuff like that. And it was almost, that one benefits from the rapid pace and the frenzy. So I didn't have to necessarily focus on that as much because you wanted it to move. Like if that one had been, three pages long, you'd there's a time where you'd have to work really, really hard to keep an audience engaged because three pages of this insanity is a lot. Like that's a lot of page for that scene. And, and I think you can absolutely do it because you could do all these quick cuts of seeing Ariel and seeing the crewmen and different parts of the ship on fire and the lightning. And you could do it. Honestly, if I was going to do it, as a two page spread, I would want it as like the the inside two pages. So you could almost do, you could almost have them be a full splash page. So it's it's the two inside pages, but they are actually connected rather than being their own separate pages. Um, so that one had a speed to it. But I think, again, part of this is personal preference because I love drawing people talking to each other. Um, but this one I think just has I think it's what makes these two characters interesting and it's the back and forth. And it's it's that that ping pong of action in wordplay. And with Midsummer Night's Dream, you had Titania giving her speech. And like we talked about, Oberon is very quiet during that. Like he talks a little bit, but he is very quiet. So that's very much like her thing and she's in control of that. And that felt very, very controlled rage to me. Whereas this one is a lot more of an open wound and a lot, like there's just a lot more there. Um, so I think it's because you have two, two specific active participants in this one who are both speaking and who are both emoting that it feels like it moves a little bit more for me. Yeah, and part of that, I think a very large part of that is because it is in prose rather than in iambic pentameter. It's not in blank verse. Oh, that would make much sense. Much ado, yeah, much ado is, um, almost entirely in prose. And so the the big difference is that you don't have a lot of the, um, I think that the language is less forced from my perspective. And I think that's why it feels so much more real to me as a play and just as, as, a, uh, as a scene, especially because in a lot of the iambic pentameter argument speeches, you have forced, syllables in there like you've stretched the line out to be 10 syllables so you have um words that are not necessarily purposeful mm -hmm. and it feels like in this scene every word is purposeful because there was no need to fit them into iambic pentameter so that makes a lot of sense so you're not sparing like you're not wasting time you're not wasting words just to fill out to the end of the of the syllables and i think that a lot of um uh a lot of like the shift in tone in this scene is that we have one of the very few instances of iambic pentameter or of um blank verse from the friar right before 
So the friar gives this whole big long speech. Hero should pretend to be dead. Um, here's what we'll do. We'll carry her off. We'll announce that she's dead. Uh, so the whole kind of wedding bit up to this point is in blank verse. It is metered. And then that all is just broken. So now we've like, we've broken down. We have uh, given up <laughs> kind of in a lot of different ways. And now we're in prose. So we're just talking. And I think that a lot of that is normally it's a sign of like an uneducated character or a clown character. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this play, since so much of it is prose, it's just, it just feels so much more natural. And so I think that's one of the reasons that it moves so well is because yeah. you get, you're not, you're not wasting words. And that's kind of the best way I can, I know it's uh, unfair to Shakespeare to say that iambic pentameter causes him to waste words, but there it is. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it's funny because that's fascinating to me because that is something that I I did not consciously think about it. Now that you're saying it, I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense because I heard it and I understood it, but it didn't it didn't cross my mind as a part of it at all. And it just I think, and it's funny because I think like with the Titania speech they are a little bit more magical so I can like in my brain they should have a little bit more fluff and they should speak in this kind of I want to say like stilted almost but like we're going to rhyme and I'm going to you know again talk about the cows and the crows and all of these <laughs> and, and add all that whereas this I feel like this is it's stripped down a little bit more because it is such a a heated moment between two characters mm -hmm. it feels more yeah it just feels realer yeah um, to me um audience how are you how do you feel um what questions do you have for swan for me for shakespeare for comics what are some of the things that you want to know what are the things that you want what do you want to learn today um <laughs> uh <laughs> usually in in the texts you have meter that delineates status um so that you know that if you're speaking in iambic pentameter, you are educated or uh, more noble or uh, a higher position in the world, whereas prose is uneducated or those um, kind of lower class characters. Whereas trochaic tetrameter is usually a sign of like fairy language, like or magical, like witch stuff. Um, so like using language, and I think we talked about this in the first one a bit, using language and meter to delineate character um, in the same way, like it is a visual impact on the page in the same way art would be. Um, Vio by Kurt wants to know more about early modern, modern <laughs> genie, uh, rules. And you know what, Kurt, genies in pop culture. Um, no, that doesn't do it. I have to put Renaissance instead of early modern y'all. The fastest way to make an early modern scholar mad is to say it's like old English or to say it's like medieval because medieval is different than early modern. Um, early modern is associated with the Renaissance, uh, but it is also not, it's not old English. Sorry. <laughs> um devil's rules for wishes dr faustus or i'm trying um also to kurt's comment with uh <laughs> how to change uh how to change tone on a dime blood lots of blood you're not mm -hmm. wrong uh, um I feel like uh, I think of like the movie Carrie that has a really uh, abrupt tone shift and it is related to blood. So that is true. Um, but, you know what, Kurt, yeah, I'm going to have to do some research. <laughs> I'm going to have to do some serious Faustian research. Uh, but yeah, so I think that the meter of words, he says the meter of words instantly makes me defensive and fight against it to make it more conversational. And I actually got in a, I got in a fight on the internet. <laughs> I'm still mad about it uh, <laughs> because someone posted in um, a Facebook group, like, why are all these 
actors posting videos completely ignoring the iambic pentameter, the integrity of the iambic pentameter. What do they think they're doing? And I was like, I think they're doing Shakespeare. Like, <laughs> what? Because, like, you have people, you have a camp of um, Shakespeareans who insist on a pause at the end of every line. So I'm going to pull up um, a different text and we're going to kind of talk through it a little bit because I think it's important to talk about. Um, so I think that's, and I, I like that, Kurt. Um, I like an iambic pentameter to music. Strict meter is fine at inception. Now let's interpret. And somebody in that Facebook conversation brought up uh, jazz. Um, and like I brought up contemporary because this guy kept saying, would you expect a... a someone going into the royal ballet to never have tried ballet before or whatever like oh i can move a little bit i'm gonna try out for the royal ballet oh i can sing a little bit i'm gonna try out for the royal opera house and i'm like that's not the same thing like where did jazz where did contemporary come from where did pop music come from they came from people understanding the rules and then breaking them to be their own interpretation also these are people in a pandemic posting videos on facebook like maybe lay off them <laughs> but um and I know when I you brought this up to me, it bothered me from, from the dance side of it because I will never be a professional ballerina. I was never going to be a professional ballerina. I can still get up and perform Swan Lake at the local community center, like at my art studio. I could dance it in my living room for all I wanted and do, you know, pas de deux with my clothes tree. It's not an insult to the Royal Ballet or the talented people or like the original thing. It's just... I love this piece of music. I love this dance. I would like to celebrate that. What? What? <sighs> right. <laughs> and I think that, like, yeah, at these high levels of performance, you need to know the rules to break them. Um, or, and, like, yes, exactly. You, you're, it's okay for you to have a preference. And, like, so when I talk about line breaks, like, I, I don't want to diss that camp of thinking because I think, like, he wrote it for a reason. Let's honor that reason. And that structure, I think, is a perfectly valid way of thinking. It's not my preference. And, like, I know the rule so I can break it. <laughs> like, I, I, to me, um, so this is a speech that I actually had this conversation with, with some academics, um, that it's from Henry IV, part one. And the first few lines are i know you all and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness yet herein will i imitate the sun who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world that when he please again to be himself being wanted he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that did seem to strangle him so we're talking about um i don't like I am resistant to my position. I don't really want to be king, but right now I'm kind of being a hooligan so that when I do decide to get my shit together, everyone's going to be way more excited about it. <laughs> so like he says, if all the year we're playing holidays to sport would be as tedious as to work, but when they seldom come, they wished for come. So like when you only have two vacation days, you're going to love those vacation days even more when Hal is such a mess about, when he starts acting like a prince, they're gonna be way more impressed than if he were acting like a prince the whole time. And I think that, um, I, I think that, that like, that's just such a great uh, theme anyway. Um, so let me hop to Kurt real quick. The only thing I take exception with is that I'm not sure you need to know the rule to break it. There can be something refreshing about interpretation without knowing the origin totally fair. I can't call myself an early modern scholar unless I know the rules to break them. Like, I think that where I am, like, with my training, like, in order to earn that, like, place of discussion, I think that, like, I have to know the rules to have studied it in that way. Some of my favorite performers have never done Shakespeare before. And, like, that's one of the things that I said to this Jamoke on the internet is that like some of the best Shakespearean actors I've seen, right, exactly. Some of the best Shakespearean actors I've, I've seen 
have never done Shakespeare before, but they read it with a modern intonation and a modern cadence that makes it instantly way more relatable to an audience. Like one of my friends, I'm like, I don't know how you do this, but like, it's perfect to keep doing it. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I think that's totally fair. Um, when I say I, I meant me, but like, yeah. So for this monologue, uh, even just like the first few lines, um, to me, uh, let me take it here. Yet here and will I imitate the sun who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world that when he please again to be himself being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that did seem to strangle him. And so like those people who, who ask for stops at the end of the line, they're not saying to stop like I just did like forever. Um, I think there are some lines that just run into each other. So by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that did seem to seem to strangle him. I don't think there needs to be a pause between mists and of because they are foul and ugly mists of vapors. That's what they are. They are not foul and ugly mists of vapors. Like it's one thought uh, to me. Yeah, that's weird. Or even um, there's a comma here after that. So to smother up his beauty from the world that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be, me, blah, 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 be more wondered at. Like, I think there are some lines that like, you earn the pause at a different section of the line. Whereas you run through other sections so that you, like you earn those pauses. If we're pausing, I know you all and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world. That's like what this guy wants. He wants to hammer in the iambic. And to me, it doesn't sound natural speaking it. And again, it's personal preference. Um, and it's all like, where, where's the punctuation? We don't know. Take all the punctuation out. Uh, start fresh. Yeah. I wouldn't put a comma uh, after a world. To smother up his beauty from the world that when he plays again to be himself, he may be more wondered at. Like, I would put the commas in a different place. And this might be a comma because it's the end of a line. And sometimes they were like, oh, this line needs punctuation. Let's put it there. And that's not a good way to <laughs> read that punctuation um gotta start fresh and uh like kurt says even just reading that he would want to change the pacing and uh -huh. you should like you should you should make it sound the most natural to you um so that it comes out of your mouth feeling natural because if it doesn't feel natural to you coming out of your mouth it's not going to sound natural the audience is going to be one step further away than they were even at the beginning and it's just going to send everyone into more confusion than they were when they started which is probably a lot <laughs> um and so like meter is i think it's important it's obviously a crucial part of shakespeare to study if you want to study it and if you're interested in like looking at the plays on a foundational level and looking at acting on a foundational level it's super important super crucial and nobody's denying that but like if you just want to do some shakespeare and like, there are some actors. I think Ethan Hawke is one of the best film Hamlets. And I don't know Ethan Hawke's training, but like he does not perform Shakespeare like a Shakespearean scholar. Like he does not perform it. Like this guy on Facebook hates Ethan Hawke. Mm. And I think there's something so natural about breaking that meter. Because, and that's why when we get something like Much Ado, I think that's why so many people like and relate to much ado because a lot of it's in prose and because it feels like a little bit more natural to to speak and digest so it's just me no it's funny because so i read romeo and juliet and hamlet in high school so those are the ones i was familiar with i have watched the parts of the kenneth Branagh, denzel washington much ado i've not seen all of it 
uh, but I want to. But I've watched mm -hmm. the Joss Whedon Much Ado. And oh, just you in have. The, I have once many years ago. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I liked it. Like that was, but again, I think that's because it made more sense to me. Like in a weird way, watching the Leonardo DiCaprio, Romeo and Juliet. I think it was acted really well. I had trouble absorbing that one because I had trouble absorbing Romeo and Juliet when I read it. Um, mm -hmm. Not that I don't understand what's going on, but it's one of those, it's a weird feeling to be sitting there either reading or watching and understand that there is, there is conflict that, you know, how people are feeling, I can understand, but I don't feel like I understand everything that's going on. And that's a weird, like watching and absorbing place because you you feel like you're out of the loop and sometimes again at least for me like sometimes i'm like i wish i understood i wish i understood what was happening and all of this other stuff you're saying a lot of stuff and i'm getting like 12 percent of it um so that's funny but just in the minimal amounts that i have consumed i have like in my brain much ado makes more sense to me and i was like no that one i kind of get like i understood what was going on in that one even though it's got so many different characters and all the schemes and hijinks and stuff. But like, I think because of exactly what you said, like even subconsciously, I was like, no, much ado, I understood. Like that one, I, I've never read it. I don't actually know it that well, but it's just that subtle, like, yeah, I get that one. Yeah. Um, Joss Whedon's Much Ado has one of my favorite moments of any Shakespearean film ever. Um, and I don't like Joss Whedon's Much Ado, <laughs> but when Sean Mayer as Don John, as the villain of this play, has disrupted this wedding, he has thrown everything into chaos, he has ruined people's lives, he walks out of the wedding and on his way out, he just takes a cupcake off the table and just eats it on his way out. And I think it is like the most brilliant acting choice. I'm like, that's the kind of actor I want to be. I want to be Sean Mayer. Because it's so, like, I think it says everything about who that character is that like look at what he's done and now he gets a treat like i think it is one of the most amazing like acting choices in a shakespeare film like of all time that's great oh i love that but i again like you talk about talented actors and interacting with scenes but just the little stuff you know the big the climax of that scene has already happened this is nothing, this is a throwaway. But no, there are moments in that where I was like, you know, like this big thing has happened and the scene's starting to conclude. I'm like, wait, 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 there's this really good part. People are like, really? The cupcake? That was your thing? And I was like, how good is that though? <laughs> like, right, how good was that cupcake? Yeah, what's up? No, I, I absolutely get that. So, and I also, I, I liked him a lot in that because I got to see more of him than I think I got to, see, that I, wow, that was a very poorly put together set. <laughs> In Firefly, I didn't feel like he had as much depth. And I don't know mm -hmm. if that was just he was new as an actor or like the role that he had was kind of stodgy. Like it just, it wasn't nearly as dynamic as the rest of the characters on screen. So it was neat for me to see him still kind of in that like aloof prick role, but I felt like he had so much more play and either he was comfortable in it because he had played it before or just like, nope, this one just, this was it. And I was like, no, you're, this is good. I enjoyed this yeah. a lot. Um, um he and Nathan Fillion was my favorite part of that. I was gonna, I was just gonna bring him up. I was like, honestly, that's the biggest part that I remember because anytime Nathan Fillion was on screen, I was so happy and him like bumbling around and being so, oh, so good. Yeah, yeah. There is so there are a bunch of different, and I think again, it speaks to how good the play is on how many different film versions there are of it. Um, but like Kenneth Branagh's. Much Ado is very classic. And I did, I, I taught Much Ado to my seniors one year. And I thought it was really interesting because as a as a whole, like on a whole, they preferred the Kenneth Branagh version to the Joss Whedon version. And I think part of that is a lot of a lot of my students have trouble reconciling modern costume to Shakespeare. Yep. yep I and that's that. I mean, it's what I spent my whole dissertation on, pretty much, but like <laughs> there's a disconnect because they expect people to be in ruffles and heavy, yeah. dress. you know, like they expect period pieces. But when we think about the fact that, and this, like, 
when Shakespeare, when these plays were happening, they were in modern dress. <laughs> right. You know, height, heightened version of, because that's what theater is. It's a heightened version of real life. But like they were in modern dress. They were not meant to be period pieces, except for, of course, the Roman plays, which were in Roman dress. Right. So like that was, those were period pieces. And so like thinking about it that way to, for me has always been like, well, yes, of course we should put, you know, definitely put Shakespeare in modern, in modern dress because it is meant to be a reflection of modern people. But like hearing the Shakespearean lines was such a disconnect for them that they preferred the kind of timeless Branna white dresses, Regency yeah. almost. Yeah, style. very, yeah, that like, this out is of kind time. of time, but not really. But yes, but you know exactly what period they're trying to be without being a period. Um, yeah, because it's not. It's like it's just like a timeless. Yeah. Anyone can wear this white dress <laughs> on the hillsides of Italy, right? Like it's yeah. just very forever. And I think that's what they responded positively to. Well, and it's this is this is only tangentially related to kind of what we we're talking about. But I was I was mulling over something when you were talking about your students and how they reacted, and thinking about it in contrast between. Romeo and Juliet and Much Ado. Um, so honestly, I was not a big fan of Romeo and Juliet because the hype over it being a love story didn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated it because my English teacher was very frank about it. And he's just like, no, they're two idiots and they're young and they do stupid things and bad things happen. And like, I mean, obviously he paid absolute like attention to the text and we did a lot of stuff, but it was that kind of like frank, like, you're in high school, you relate to these high school age characters and the overflow of emotion. And it's funny to me now because if I'm going to, we'll say maybe relate to a character more, it's going to be someone more on the end of like Beatrice and Benedict because they've lived a little bit more life. And so, you know, where there was already a disconnect for me with Romeo and Juliet as a high schooler, like I could see them having trouble connecting with like, what? These are people in like their 30s. Like, what are they griping about? I don't understand why they, but I was like, but no, you realize as you've gotten to that point now in my 30s, I have a lot more set personality and set opinions than I did as a high school student. So yeah. it's a lot, you know, dating's a lot harder because you're already fully formed people and you're not as squishy anymore. So I'm like, no, you do this and I don't like this. And I'm going to be real honest with you that I don't like this. And I'm not maybe as willing to change for you and like that part of it. So that was, it was an interesting side by side with kind of what Mike was saying about them being older. And I was like, it's a very different conversation because they are complete people interacting as complete people rather than, you know, squishy babies uh, yeah. who are just love and hormonal. So I love, um, if you want an adult version of Romeo and Juliet, and I don't mean like a, you know, <laughs> modern XXX sexy version. Um, I'm sure. I'm I mean, sure basically, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, but adults, I would suggest reading Antony and Cleopatra. Because Ooh, you want to okay. talk about selfish, emotionally driven people. And especially with the, you know, kind of the, the image we get of Cleopatra from history and movies. And then the image we get of Mark Antony from Julius Caesar, who's like the voice of reason and the, the hero, um, they are awful in Antony and Cleopatra. They are disasters. And maybe I'll bring something from that one of these days, because like they are wrecks, like <laughs> total emotional, it's 4 a.m. and you're still on the couch drinking wine, wrecks. Like, <laughs> And they're so fully developed in that emotional immaturity that, like, you still feel like it's a real person. We've all had that friend who, like, one thing will set them off and then they're just on a total tirade for, you know, ever. Or, like, the pettiness. Like, it's such a an adult, real person version of that young, stupid love. Yeah, idea from Romeo and Juliet, and obviously it ends the same. But like, <laughs> I think it's a really good one um, to show that like real rounded person and still being a total idiot. Like, you're so. Why are you doing this? <laughs> you just made. You just sent your people to tell your boyfriend that you're dead because you're mad at him because he <laughs> took his ships away. 
Uh, you protected your army by turning your ships home and abandoned him on the battlefield. And he got mad at you. So you got mad at him. So you told him you were dead and he killed himself. And then you killed, like, it's so bad. But they're so real. Like, <laughs> there's something about them that feels so, like, real. <laughs> uh, it's like, it's sending that really shitty text and then turning your phone off. I'm just like, exactly what Whoa. it is <laughs> exactly so just, what it is that could be kind of fun and this is something obviously you've given me complete creative control for all of these which is absolutely fun but it would be very fun uh in the future one of these if we came up with one like you were talking about adapting it to like the 90s um with the much ado that you did, like if we set a scene and you we came into it and said, okay, we are doing Anthony and Cleopatra, but we're setting it in in this. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, you know, I kind of I kind of also live in the Kenneth Branagh land where I'm just like, it's just vaguely period enough that you can tell that it's a thing, but it's not a specific time period. Um, but taking it and adapting it to specifically be like, you know, these are these two characters, but they're living in, you know, we'll say a place that has smartphones or something. Right. So, Right. That oh, that's yeah, that would be really fun because it can be like a we can get audience suggestions. Yeah. Some wheels, do some uh Shakespeare roulette. <laughs> <laughs> I like he would like that, I think. I feel like that's yeah. a very like what I do think he would. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was a there's a theater down here who did um Merry Wives of Windsor a couple of years ago and they did it as a, a 50s sitcom. So they did it like I Love Lucy style. And it worked That's so cool. well that it, like it, you it, you had trouble believing that the play wasn't written for that. Again, we go back to the Noodlehead on Facebook. Like literally, this is the beautiful thing about this text that you can take it and it's such a good story and it's so evocative that you can make it into your own and it's still enjoyable. Yep. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um i love how sad benedict looks in the uh, far right second panel down the dismay on his <laughs> face and like just and like again like even without facial expressions like is this the way that okay so i'm looking on the bottom uh, the first page mm -hmm. the last panel yep the way that like their bodies make a heart yeah and i don't know if that's the drink flying or if it's like background or what it is but like just the way that like because you've made the arch on the top and the way that their bodies like make the point at the bottom is so clever and so cool and like where does that idea come from <laughs> oh i wish i knew i wish some of it was planned and i think it's so some of it is, and I, <laughs> I wish Mayor Squish was here because she would, she'd laugh at me because she asked a question once and I was like, it's practice. Yeah. <laughs> How are you so good? But I was like, but some of it is, and some of it is a huge step for me in my art and my art growth was when I was able to start taking the images that I saw in my head and translating them to the page the way that I wanted them to look. And as I've consumed more media and done different things and played with different page layouts and stuff like that, like when we were talking about like the throwing of the drink, this is the panel I saw in my head. Like it needs to be over her shoulder so that you're seeing her like launch it at him. You're getting his full reaction. Like these are how they, they appear in my head as what this scene needs to show. And then like, as I put it down, like, and I think you saw me at one point I was resizing and working with it. So that's the fun part. Then like, okay, so this is the, will essentially say like, okay, so they're frozen in this shape. So that's the shape it's going to be. Now, if I want to, I could rotate the camera around this shape and show it a little bit differently because I've already let my brain check off the fact that I was like, nope, we've got the pose. Now we just have to figure out the exact camera angle to really make it the most readable. Like if I needed to twist it a little bit more so you could see more of her face, if that was mm -hmm. important, like, it's still going to be the same pose. It's just going to be drawn from a slightly different angle. But like, that part of it so some of it is just and again i think it's it's getting to a point where i've watched a lot of you know we'll say arguments between couples either in real life or in movies and and media so like there are certain hits and because i like watching people's body language again we talk about the body language i was like i 
I want to tell this story. So like we've done with all the other sketching Shakespeare so far, if there isn't any text or any dialogue, you still have kind of an idea of what's going on. And that's, that's where, again, I think that's where comics win. When they win, they win big. If you could take away all of the dialogue and still be really engaged in what was going on on the page, because that's where the actual excitement is happening. And the text is just gravy, not hot yeah. gravy. That's VO by Kurt and Chet. But yeah, so, <laughs> so I like that. And again, you know, but I think again, we're just going to hype Shakespeare, which if you would have asked me 20 years ago, if I was going to be sitting around hyping Shakespeare, I would have said no. But I think that, again, because it's written for stage and it's written to be performed, it's literally set up to make it that much more visual, even when it's just two characters talking to each other. Yeah. Well, and so when I was trying to pick pieces, I was talking to a friend of mine last night and I was like, all of the pieces I like are so internal. Like I'm, I'm trying to find something that has like high energy, high action, um, to like make it less, uh, less static or less, you know, uh, em emotionally internal or whatever. And he's yeah. like, well, you could do this speech because think about like how you could direct it like this. And I was like, you don't understand. I'm not directing it. <laughs> I don't get any say on the movement of it. So like how I wanted to pick a piece that had enough like to grab hold of in it uh, and he's like yeah but you could do this with this and i'm like i know i could <laughs> i know yeah. that like i yes thank you but like what are some speeches that have like inherent movement and yeah. that's what i because a lot of them don't and right. that's the struggle is that like a lot of because it's all staged the words are not super active and a lot of action because like it's more expensive and takes a lot longer to stage action. A lot of like Antony and Cleopatra, 15,000 battles in that play, none of them on, are on stage. Not a single <laughs> bit of action is on stage. Henry the Fourth, all of, or Henry the Fifth, I mean, all of your battles, nothing on stage. Zero is staged. And part of that is because it does not look realistic on stage. It is hard to stage battles. Yeah. Um, but like, that's what the audience wants to see. And I imagine like as an as an artist, like that's what the audience wants to see. They want to see the action. They want to see like stuff happening. They don't want to just see two people standing in a room having a conversation. Well, and again, so you talk about and this is a big, big thing that is really important to me. And it, it usually starts with comics and then I spiral it off into other mediums. But if if the point of your characters is the two of them talking in that interaction, why? Why do you need it to be a comic and not just a novel or not just a play? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. So how do you most utilize the medium that you're in? So again, you know, if this is a movie, you can do walk and talks. You can do back and forth. You can do quick cuts to establish like a quicker pace. You can do long shots that are held a lot longer to slow it back down. You can do all of that, you know, or like you've been talking about with the punctuation and with the, the pacing of the lines and the language that they use, speed up or slow down or indicate different classes. So when it comes to putting this to a static media that is still has an artistic element to it, why does this need to be shown this way? Is kind of, and I mean, again, obviously this is self-serving because I want to do it, but how could I, you know, part of this was, how could I make this accessible to somebody else? You know, if... I'm coming at it from a, a less familiar Shakespeare point of view. So how do I translate what you're explaining to me into my art and into the images that I'm creating so that as someone looks at it and reads along, there is that togetherness of understanding with the words and the pictures. Mm -hmm. So that, that being a motivation that like, okay, so we're doing it this and we're not just doing it like you were saying, like, to have like, so you've got a whole block of text and you've got a picture of one person talking and then you've got a whole block of text and you've got a picture of one person talking. Like that's not an interesting way to do it. And then there's no right. reason, you know, you could just have photographs or like, you don't need it to be like that. So. But it's also not interesting on stage either because you don't have like in a movie, like you said, you can have walk and talks, you can have like scenery changes, you can have all of those things. On stage, you're so much more limited to the stage like your your lighting can only do so much your costuming can only do so much like and you can have the actors doing things of course on stage but like to me you really have to buy those moments of just a conversation with 
if your play is moving 90 miles an hour, 90 miles a minute, 90, I don't know, whatever, fast. <laughs> if you're moving fast for the whole play, and that's, again, to me, what this scene is, is the play is a mile a minute until this scene. Mm -hmm. And the, this is what you've bought. You've bought your conversation. You've bought, and, like, there still has to be movement in it, but, like, this, you've earned this. Uh, someone said to me once, you got to earn your pauses. And, like, oh, yes. God, there's nothing more painful than a to be. Oh, God. Not to be. <laughs> that. Oh is the question whether it is nobler <laughs> like i don't want to, i don't want to watch that no unless your hamlet has been breakneck speed for the entire play and now you've paused yeah and then it's breakneck speed for the whole rest of the play like it has to be like you have to earn your pauses and they meant it more literally within a monologue you have to like flow past those commas and then like find your moment to pause yeah and again but like on the overall scale of the play as well you've got to earn those pauses and i think earn earn your pauses is the best advice anyone has ever given to me for shakespeare especially well and i like it too and this was this was also something very cool and i can talk about it because he's gone now but there was something really really cool listening to you and mike interact with each other reading it because it is such an interactive scene, but you also, not only do you have a familiarity with each other, but you have a familiarity with these characters and acting. And so there's a lot of that, if it were just two random people reading, you wouldn't have gotten that. But you would talk over each other and interrupt and then pause. And those pauses there hit even harder. Like just listening to that, I'm like, ooh, that's exciting. And that's, you know, in my brain, I'm making a mental note, like that's an art moment. Like that's a pause moment because you build up and you build up and then you, breath and pause sure and it, oh it's good it's good it's um hot. so this um this whole bit down like right from um you dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy when she answers as claudio thine enemy i treat this like a monologue so when i learned these lines i could not have told you when mike was supposed to interrupt me and like in the actual play, I don't know if he, I don't know if he did or, or didn't because I just kept going because mm -hmm. I would eat his heart in the marketplace, talk with a man out a window. And so like, none of these are important except right. for his character development of like needing to like, uh, control the situation or, or, or get the situation back on track. But like, nothing is... Like, it's just a monologue and yeah. it should feel like this whole thing just like explodes until the end. And he has that enough because like he's right that it needs to be more thoughtful than just like, OK, now I will. I will. Right. audio now. So like you have to but you have to earn that. Yeah. Break. And it was it was great because the way Mike was playing it is he was he was talking along with you, but it wasn't a. It wasn't a forceful interruption. At no point did I feel like when he was trying to say something, again, partially because you know what's going to happen as you're reading it, but like he wasn't really trying to stop you. Like the character is saying, but like she's a locomotive and she's just going and there's no yeah. stopping her. And so like he'd get a word in and then she'd just keep going. And like that, again, builds that momentum, builds that tension. And that makes it just, again, a really enjoyable listening experience for that part. And I, like I, well, I love the idea of you approaching it as a monologue and having a scene partner that was like, uh, but uh, oh, but wait, uh, and having you essentially not react to him, like that's great. Because again, like we talked about with the Titania thing, like she's just going. Good luck. <laughs> and that's the difference with with Oberon is that he doesn't even try. Like, and that says a lot about his character that like he lets her get it out and. Yeah. Oh, it's so, so good. <laughs> it's so good. Thank you all so much for, for coming and joining us today. Um, follow a swan named Emily on the internet because um, you'll pop this up when it's... Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. And so with this one, because, yeah. because we had the actual first time having two pages, what I will do is I will try and save it out as it is right now so you can see my work from this two-hour period, and then I will 
show the actual like how I would finalize it more so you can see like what all of these plans actually were <laughs> once yeah. I was done with them. That's so cool. Um, <laughs> so Swan named Emily, um, Doodle Crew, catch them. Uh, the 27th is your next one? Yep. yep, coming up on Saturday. Yeah, so pretty much uh, if you want to be notified when I'm doing cool art stuff, follow us on or twitch.tv slash a swan named Emily. That's where a lot of my art stuff lives. Also go over, follow twitch.tv slash almost daily pod where you can see more of Steph and I and the boys on Wednesday night. So yeah, those are the two big ones. If you want to watch and listen. Heck yeah. Um, for me, we've got our next live show coming up tomorrow night at 8 PM Eastern on twitch.tv slash SRSB as underscore network. And you can follow me at P2M pod. Um, this week, our episode this week was just me and Mike talking about Beatrice and Benedict and sitcoms. So like you've <laughs> got some, now you have some inside information to know where we were coming from for these character choices. Um, I think it'll be fun for y'all to, especially if you're Marvel fans, um, to listen through those arcs that we would take. Cause this was the scene that I chose for Beatrice. That's like her grief. Like this is the moment she explodes into a whatever spoiler. <laughs> um, oh, I like that a lot. So like, that's where we, and once again, Mike brings a very interesting and a state take on Benedict that I had never thought of before. So <laughs> Protest Too Much podcast at P2M Pod all around the world. Um, and then, of course, on Monday nights, uh, every other Monday night with Swan on yeah. Almost Daily Pod. Yeah, but follow Thank us. We, we, we talk about this a lot. We, we tell you yeah. where we're going. So. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for sticking around. Um, we love you. Bye. <laughs> oh.